Hey team, uh, after watching my last video, I realized that I was uh, a bit sad sounding and a bit flat. So I'm going to try and be a little bit happier during this one. We'll see how we go. Uh, and there's plenty of things to be happy about. Well, kind of. The new economic policy. We know that the uh, Kronstadt uprising caused the Bolsheviks and the Communist Party to look in on themselves and really think about um, what they could be doing better. Had they really moved away from their traditional um, October values um, with the use of war communism. So in terms of that, we think about the betrayal of the workers. The new economic policy we're going to learn a lot about is uh, just as hotly debated in terms of its impact and what it meant for the new society um, with the ideas that it brought forward. So this is again another point that you want to be talking about in your essays for the exam if you get if you do it on Russia where you're talking about the new society and the values that they tried to uphold or what they fought for in the beginning is what they had at the end that kind of stuff so let's have a quick look at what it's all about basically uh, it was proposed at the 10th party conference um, which is a big gathering of the Communist Party it's like their big annual uh, get-together um, and so this was proposed in 1921. Basically, the idea was to promote economic recovery. Okay, Some people call it um, taking a breather. Um, you know, it's just a bit of respite from war communism. So, what's it about? Well, there's a whole bunch of things it's about. It's uh, grain requisitioning was to be taken away. Um, the idea was to create um, a tax in kind meaning that um, instead of paying taxes, you would pay taxes with your grain, but you didn't have to give up all your grain. Once you gave up a certain quota of your grain, then you could use the rest as you saw fit. And if you wanted to sell that on in some way, then you could. That sounds a lot like capitalism, I hear you say, and you would be correct. So here's some of the basic elements. Basically what they tried to do is they tried to reintroduce uh, private trade, uh, and that was everywhere from peasants being able to sell their grain to small businesses and uh, and the like opening up in the cities. Um, they relaxed the state control of industry, um, but they still held on pretty tightly to that. Um, but they did relax it a little bit. Uh, Labour armies were abandoned completely, um, and they tried to introduce a new currency as well. Interesting quote uh, from your textbook, which says, if war communism was a leap into communism, then the NEP was a leap out of it. So, as you hopefully would have picked up, that this idea, the elements of the new economic policy seem to be a step away from socialism or communism and a step back towards uh, capitalism. Uh, one of the things that Lenin did when he addressed the part of the Congress of Soviets is that he stressed that this was a temporary measure. Okay, he argued that this was. Um, it has been argued that it was a pragmatic response to Russia's situation. You know, you think about the war communism and some of the quotes that you've read about what the cities were like, what the countrysides were like, the amount of people that died from famine. They needed to stimulate their economy in order to get their. Um, not just the public support back, but also to keep the country going, to get the country back into a position where people were able to live a decent life. This caused quite a bit of division in the ranks. One of the biggest who originally spoke out about it was Trotsky. Um, he described it as the re-emergence of capitalism. Um, he also predicted and was correct that there would be a new class uh, emerge and that would be what they called NEP men or NEP men um, and they would benefit from this new system. So these were um, I suppose people that would benefit from the opening of small businesses, from the relaxation of um, controls on industry, people who have a sell grain on, you know, um, almost like that idea of the kulaks that they were talking about before. So Trotsky envisaged that there would be a group of people, a class of people that could very quickly make money 
with the emergence of a capitalistic ideal that came in after war communism. Lenin wasn't the only one. There are other people who spoke out against this. We're going to talk about one of them in a sec. Um, <clears throat> but it's important to note that um, after the introduction of the NEP, Lenin quickly introduces a party resolution uh, known as anti-factionalism. Uh, so the anti-factionalism motion basically said if you speak out against the NEP, then you'll be removed from the party. Okay, so really trying to shut down any kind of dissenting voices. Uh, and this is quite interesting now. You see this small split start to appear between Trotsky and Lenin in this regard. Lenin also outlaws any other political parties, so no SRs, no Mensheviks, none of that stuff. They're not even allowed to congregate or be considered anymore. Um, and that has been happening in terms of bans and stuff previously. But um, it is at this stage where Lenin completely removes them from any sort of uh, political forum, therefore consolidating his power. So, as I said before, um, one of the key Bolsheviks who opposed this early on was Bukharin, who initially spoke out against the uh, NEP, uh, also thoroughly disliking its uh, look and feel which was very similar to capitalism. Um, but after the anti-factionalism decree put out by Lenin, he very quickly turns around to support it. Um, many members saw it as a retreat into capitalism. Um, others saw it as a breathing spell. So in order to you know, get the country back on its feet, uh, war communism was probably a bit too harsh at the time. And Lenin and some of his closest supporters saw this more as like a transition phase um, and with the idea that it would be only temporary. So, the results. Now you can't see the dates because they're a bit blocked off at the end, but this is 1913, uh, so we can see that the value of factory output there and also the electricity in terms of kilowatts. And that was a big thing that Lenin wanted to do was to get electricity out to as much of Russia as it could because there was still large parts of Russia that had not really ever had electricity. So we can see here now, beginning back in 1921, at the beginning of the NEP, that we see a steady increase. Not quite up to the 1913 levels yet, but quite a positive increase in the value of factory output as well as the amount of kilowatts and the amount of electricity. Okay, electricity allows for um, better working conditions and stuff like that. So it's, that's obviously going to add to the productivity of different, um, different places, different workforces um, around the country. So that's one aspect. The other aspect you can see here is out in the countryside. So the grain harvest you can see here 1913 uh, it's quite high and we also have the worker wage especially 1921 to 1923 there is a, a relatively steep increase which is really positive um, and that is due to the uh, relaxation of, of grain requisition um, also I talked earlier about the tax in kind in some provinces or in some um, parts of the country, they completely ignored the tax initially to get their grain levels up to make sure everybody was fed and also you know, to sell that on if they could. Um, you can see that there is a bit of a dip here uh, between 1923 and 1924. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in a minute and what caused that. Um, but you can see down here at the bottom in the kind of turquoisey color, the average worker's wage is again on the increase. So it seems to be working economically. Okay, It seems to be a success in terms of returning some of the key elements of their society back to where it was in 1913. Okay, But at what cost? So some of the results are is that the agricultural recovery is much faster than the industrial recovery. And that's due to privatization. So out in the countryside, um, peasants 
get full run of what they grow and how they sell it and they can start to make money, they can start to trade grain and they're doing quite well. But that also means that food from the countryside is now pouring into the cities, which is really, really good as well. But because agricultural recovery due to privatization grew so quickly, the state still controlled the industrial output, which meant that that didn't grow as quickly. And the problem with that is, is that prices for goods, certain goods in the city was quite high, which is not great. And even though there was lots of food, if there's lots of food around, that drives the price down. Okay, so if the prices for food are dropping, then there's less incentive for the peasant class or the, the farmers to make extra grain because they can't sell it and make the money that they want to make. And we saw the problem during grain requisitioning when peasants don't make surplus grain. When peasants don't make surplus grain, people in the city starve. Okay, now if peasants can't make any money off their grain because the prices are so low, well then they're not going to make extra grain. Okay, so this can be a uh, an issue and it did become a crisis in 1923 and they called it the scissor crisis so what was the scissor crisis well the scissor crisis began when grain prices were dropping uh, and the incentive for peasants in the countryside to grow surplus grain would disappear that was the idea this causes Trotsky to threaten a split of the party because Trotsky was a big pusher of this he thought that this was a big deal because he realized that if food shortages happen again well there could be more riots again so he creates the platform of 46 which is 46 bolsheviks that are supporting the idea that the new economic plan is not the way to go and that is dangerous and that it has moved too far away from the um, socialist and communist ideals at this stage in the game, Lenin has had a significant number of strokes because of the bullet in his neck, if you can remember back to when his, uh, his attempted assassination occurred. So we don't see this big battle occurring like we would because Lenin is, is very, very weak and he's not fighting back. And even though there is that uh, the decree anti-factionalism, there's no one really driving its enforcement at, the, at present. Just when you thought this was going to cause a big, big split, the industrial output resolves the problem, okay, without any bloodshed, okay, there's no confrontation and basically this crisis goes away. So the NEP has its positives, okay, the working conditions are increasing, the electricity to the countryside is increasing, there is food around, uh, and it seems to be working positively for the members of the country. But the dilemma is, is it communism? And this is the, uh, the hot debate that you will have to figure out to yourself in justification. Was this part of the new society? Was this a reaction? How does this policy fit in terms of the um, the grand new society that the Bolsheviks were trying to create. It caused a split, a potential split between Trotsky and Lenin. Um, and we talked earlier about the reasons why Lenin thought it was a good idea and why Trotsky thought it wasn't a good idea. I found this quote, which I think is a good one, um, by Lynch, which talks about economic policy in general in trying to create the new society um, by the Bolsheviks. And it says here that the economic policy of the Bolsheviks was a series of fragmented responses to a series of desperate situations. I think that sums it up for mine. Uh, if you think about state capitalism, didn't really work, but it was it kind of fit at the time. Um, and then the civil war brought in the perfect opportunity for opportunity for them to institute war communism, which fit with the ideals but pragmatically cost the lives of millions in the country um, but it was 
an attempt at true communism. It was an attempt at the ideals. Um, the new economic policy was a reaction to try and stop that after the, the spark of the Kronstadt Rebellion. Um, and I think ultimately this quote is pretty spot on. Um, there was ideals and then there was pragmatism and all the while you can't do much uh, change if you're not in power and I think that's why the Bolsheviks seem so reactionary in terms of their economic policies. So, when you're looking at the new economic policy, um, also flick through your textbook. I think it starts at about... Um, page 188. Um, it also talks about sort of the artistic development, um, the the education and literacy policies that the Bolsheviks brought in, and also the, the progression of women's rights, all part of the new society and, uh, and happening around the times of the... Um, of the new economic policy at the end of the um, civil war. So they're not crucial, they're not as crucial as a new economic policy, but they, they are interesting in terms of being able to add to your um, overall impression of the creation of the new society. Um, so again, just another application task here um, there's an activity on um, page 183, activity 2. It says to do group work. I don't want you to do group work. If you could just do those questions individually, answer them in your book. You don't have to create it on a sheet of paper or anything like that. Just answer those questions. So you can just apply some of your understanding. Okay. Um, the next video, which I'll have to make while I'm on camp, will be um, talking about the end of Lenin and the immersion of the Red Tsar, or Stalin, as we know him. So um, I'll talk to you about the power play that is that. It's very, very interesting, and then we're pretty much done with our course. So uh, good luck. Keep revising. Um, keep doing practice exam questions, and um, I will see you later in the week. Bye-bye.